you all know the coker langen beck approach it's the workhorse approach to the posterior acetabulum the posterior column it's a non-extensile approach as you all know so the colored area is what's accessible you can increase the area that's accessible by doing an osteotomy and releasing the gluteus maximus tendon but this is basically what you get you can also apply a clamp through the notch to access the anterior column but you're not getting direct visualization only palpation so I'll, this is a brief case example this is clearly a pattern that you're going to want to have some form of a posterior approach on it's a transverse acetabular fracture with the posterior wall and some intercalary comminution there and this actually gets to your question of when you want to, getting back to Connor's talk, and when you want to use the ilioinguinal over a stopa. So obviously you're going to go coker langen back to get to the back, but then what do you want to do about the anterior column transverse pattern here? If this was an early fracture, if, you, if you're able to get to this fracture early, we would probably plan on doing a coker, fixing the back, and then a clamp through the notch to squeeze this in a percutaneous anterior column screw. But in most of your guys' situations, it sounds like the patients are delayed for weeks. And if you wanted an accurate reduction here, and this patient was delayed for a couple of weeks, an accurate reduction here, this may be one that you could better see through the middle window rather than coming through the stopa. So digressing a little bit because we're supposed to be talking about the posterior approach. Again, accessing all of this, the transverse component here and the comminuted posterior wall here. So indications, again, posterior wall, posterior column fractures, transverse patterns. And then, as Dr. Clavino mentioned, some of the more difficult associated patterns where you need to directly visualize the posterior column in order to get an accurate reduction. So one of the big uh, debates is, is uh, prone versus lateral positioning. And we can maybe talk in our breakout session later this morning about the merits of going prone versus lateral. Uh, it, no matter what position you have the patient in, as you all know, the knee should be flexed and the hip extended to reduce the incidence of a sciatic nerve palsy. Uh, if, if they're prone like this, we typically just put a padded Mayo, we flex the knee up and put a padded Mayo stand underneath the foot for the duration of the case to protect, uh, to protect the nerve. So the skin incision is from the posterior superior iliac spine. This is the Langenbeck limb down to the tip of the greater trochanter and then the coker limb along the long axis of the femur. Come to the skin subcutaneous tissue. You're identifying the fascia of the gluteus maximus proximally and distally the IT band. Those are both incised sharply to expose the underlying structures. Now the gluteus, so the IT band is split. The gluteus maximus fascia is incised and then you bluntly dissect the gluteus maximus up. And what limits that exposure proximally is gonna be the inferior gluteal neurovascular bundle as it's arborizing and innervating the gluteus maximus. So there are small branches that'll be encountered and will likely be uh, transected as you come up, but when you get to the main neurovascular bundle, that's going to limit the proximal extent of your exposure. And then you're exposing all of the underlying short external rotators, and most of the time there's some degree of trauma to these structures, and it's less of a pretty picture than this one. This is not the surgical approach, but I think this is a nice picture to demonstrate where that inferior gluteal neurovascular bundle is. So this is the gluteus max, which has been transected. In your surgical approach, you're going to split it. So the most proximal extent of your incision is going to be right here, where you get the main neurovascular bundle coming out. So again, in order to uh, increase your exposure, you can do a partial tenotomy of the gluteus maximus tendon in the more caudal field of the surgery so that you can really get that uh, gluteus maximus elevated so you can access the short external rotators. This is one reason why some people don't really like having the patient in the prone position because you have to have an assistant who's retracting the gluteus maximus up the whole time. Um, so you've exposed the short external rotators and then you're gonna make a tenotomy of the piriformis tendon followed by the conjoint tendon or the obturator internus tendon. And that's, uh, that's gonna be, these probably aren't coming, gonna come out great, but patient's head on this side patient's feet there, vastus lateralis here, gluteus medius here, short external rotators up here, gluteus minimus. So this is the piriformis tendon, which has been tagged. 
This is the obturator internus tendon, which has been tagged. So first, the piriformis tendon is tenotomized. And as you all know, 80% or so of the time, the piriformis tendon is going to be uh, just posterior to the sciatic nerve. So it should be ventral to the piriformis tendon. And as you tenotomize it, you're going to expose the nerve. The obturator internus, as it's tenotomized and elevated, is, most, is going to protect the sciatic nerve. Now, a couple words of caution. We know there's variability in the piriformis uh, or the piriformis relationship to the sciatic nerve. And then also a lot of these patients have had a dislocation at the time of trauma, have been reduced, but now you put them on the table and they may have dislocated again. So, so oftentimes the anatomy is going to be uh, distorted from the injury, but also if they're dislocated on the table, it's going to distort things further. So it's important to really take your time at this step to identify piriformis, to identify nerve, and obturator internus. Once you've tenotomized this and retracted up, you can follow back the obturator internus tendon all the way into the lesser sciatic notch. Once you're into the lesser sciatic notch, you know you have the nerve protected, you can put a retractor in there. So here, this is a picture of the sciatic nerve. The piriformis has been retracted up. The obturator internus, as you can see, is below the sciatic nerve. So as this gets retracted up, greater or lesser sciatic notch is going to be in here and you're protecting the piriformis. So we'll see that today. So once you've done that, you've exposed the posterior column and the posterior wall of the acetabulum. You can have a retractor in the lesser sciatic notch and then gently be retracting on the sciatic nerve in the gluteus maximus. The quadratus femoris, as we know, is home to the medial femoral circumflex artery, so we stay out of that zone so you're not damaging the blood supply to the femoral head. And then Returning to this picture, so we've now tenotomized piriformis, we've tenotomized the, the uh, conjoint tendon, retracted that. The superior gluteal neurovascular bundle is going to be in the most cranial aspect of your surgical exposure now. So it's always important to keep that in mind because that, if you injure that, can be a source of bleeding, which can be ultimately devastating. So again, up here now in the most cranial aspect of your wound is a danger zone. What uh, the AO has now nicely drawn for us is a percutaneously applied or through the wound chance pin into the greater trochanter to allow for dislocate or not dislocation, but subluxation of the hip so you can look in the joint. What they have shown, though, is the capsule has been divided. Most of the time, we're not doing this because the patient has a posterior wall fracture with the capsule labral complex attached to it. If you're dividing the capsule, you're devascularizing that posterior wall, right? So in order to look into the joint rather than splitting this capsule, we're reflecting that wall piece with the capsule and the labrum still attached to it. And then either applying traction like this or a femoral distractor in order to distract the joint and look into it. So I apologize, I didn't get x-ray examples of this, but we can talk about it in, um, in the lab later this morning, the femoral distractor, the universal distractor, one pin is super acetabular in the cranial portion of your, your incision, and the other goes directly into the trochanter, like Dr. Clavino's x-ray example. You can apply the distractor and get a very, very good visualization of the joint by doing so. And uh, remember that you're, you're really respecting the capsule and the labrum attached to that posterior wall fragment so that you're not devascularizing that fragment. The reduction in the fixation of the posterior column and posterior wall depends on, uh, or the reduction strategies depend on what injury you're treating. And we can talk about, you know, the various injury patterns and how we're reducing those. Um, and then the plate application as well. Typically, I think as you guys all know, if you're treating a, a posterior wall fracture, you're gonna have a more peripheral plate along the posterior wall, and then a, a, a second plate along the posterior column to support both of those structures individually. So the specific risks, risks of this approach include sciatic nerve injury. So most of the time that's a sciatic nerve palsy, either associated with not relaxing the nerve during the surgery with knee flexion, hip extension, or vigorous retraction on the nerve throughout the case. So I would, I would implore everybody just at any time when you're pausing during the case to talk, to look at equipment, etc., have your assistant relax on the nerve so it has time to breathe. Uh, superior gluteal artery injury uh, can be can be a devastating problem. Most of the time, if you pack 
If you get brisk bleeding from that area, pack it, pack it, pack it, pack it, and wait. Give it a good 10, 15 minutes, and most of the time it's, it's going to stop bleeding. Uh, if it does not, typically it, the artery is retracted through the notch and can be a, a very challenging problem to control. Uh, the medial femoral circumflex artery I mentioned lives at the superior border of the quadratus femoris, and there's just no reason to be operating down there. So take your time to identify it and stay away from it, and you'll reduce the risk of avascular necrosis. Heterotopic ossification we know is a common complication after these injuries and operations. Uh, some people feel that, some surgeons feel that if you debride a lot of the traumatized and, and uh, dead muscle back there, that may reduce patient's risk. Um, but that's something that uh, we sort of continue to kind of argue about, and uh, we know that that's a risk that may not be modifiable in some patients.